checking one, two, three. I guess we can, am I supposed to dance to this music, Justin? Okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> and can everybody hear me more or less well? That's good. Well, thank you and welcome to tonight. This is session three in our Science is Theology series. And uh, this will be the last one for now, anyways. We'll be reconvening perhaps in September. So thanks for coming. And tonight we're going to look at archaeology and God. And the question is going to be, is the Bible, can we apply a test, a testability to the, to the biblical narrative and determine whether or not it's truly historical? Is the sound about right? Is this too loud? Perfect. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, so before we start, actually, a slight small announcement. Uh, we Unify is running a political uh, movement. Uh, they're gathering, they have an elections committee, and they're moving, they're putting a bunch of candidates up on the docket for this municipal election season. So in October, we're going to have, everything's up for grabs. All the council seats, the mayoral seats, the school trustees, and they're hoping to flood the candidate pool. And next Sunday, not tomorrow, but next week, uh, at Cowichan Valley, uh, sorry, where is it? Shawnigan Lake Park, West Shawnigan Lake Park. So reach out to We Unify if you want to get more details, but they are going to have a meet and greet with all the existing candidates. So again, we want to become a part of the fabric of local politics. I think that's one of our moves coming down the road. And uh, either inform yourself if you don't want to show up, but try and know who to vote for when the ballots come out, right? Want to know if it's a blue-haired feminist or a regular person, right? Okay, let's get started. Most published books in history. Uh, in the top six list, we have books such as, can anybody guess what's part of the top five? Okay, that's clearly... <laughs> That doesn't take much uh, research. Who do you, besides the Bible, what would you think would be up there? Mao, yes, he's up there. Uh, Hobbit sold 100 million, well, has published, they've printed 100 million of The Hobbit. Uh, Charles Dickens is at 200 million. If you take collected works, by the way, like the collected works of Shakespeare is like 800 million, and Harry Potter is 500 million, all the Harry Potters, right? But as individual works, um, the Quran is 800 million, and Mao's Little Red Book is at 1 billion. Now, Mao's Red Book was compulsory, so I can't say it hit the free market and was very popular in and of itself. You had to have one, right? Or else you were potentially going to jail. Of all the free will books, what's the number one position? It is the Bible, kind of overdid the glowing over on the font there. Bible stands at 5 billion, and that is according to the Guinness Book of Records. I think that's a conservative estimate, but it's, even with a conservative estimate, it's head and shoulders above everything else. Um, and this is what it would look like as a graph. To the left-hand side, each, each block is 10 million. So this is what 200 million looks like. This is what 800 million looks like. This is what a billion looks like. Now put all those together times it by 2.12, so twice as much, more than twice as much as this is what it would take to reach uh, the five plus billion mark for the Bible. Uh, not only that, but it's the most accessed book online. Take just one, uh, everybody, anybody here use Bible Gateway or Gateway, Bible Gateway online? Yeah, it's one of the more popular ones. And four years ago in 2018, it had its 25th anniversary and it said that it hit 14 billion hits. So that's just one website of all the many, there's a few of the big ones. That's how popular the Bible is. Now how universally accepted or thirsted for a book is, is sometimes measured by how many languages it's translated into. Um, I'll tell you the top three most translated books. Number one is Pinocchio, or number three, sorry, is Pinocchio. And uh, it's translated, I didn't know there was such a thing as, two, there's only 200 countries. Apparently there's over 200 languages. Number two, second place, is The Little Prince, The Petit Prince, 
and it's translated in 380 languages. Give you a wild guess as to which one's number one. Right, the Bible. And how many languages do you think it's been translated into? 3,000. I mean, yeah. Which I don't know even know what that means. How can you have that many languages? But this is what they tell us, so we're just going to believe them. Whoops. We, uh, another technical difficulty. Uh, can you hear me, Justin? We've got a... Is that my end? Sorry, bear with me. This is a presentation dependent uh, moment. Um, by the way, what do you guys think are, what's the other major holy book in all of history? There's two major religions, two religions that you put together. What, go ahead. Uh, is it the Quran? There's the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindu scriptures, right? There's the Pali Canon of Buddhism. Oh, we're back. The Talmud is a Jewish uh, addition to the uh, Old Testament. You go, you're all wrong. I'll show you. Good. I've got something to teach you. That's good. All right, back to here, boom, and boom. 100 most influential people in history, according to Time Magazine, not exactly Christianity Today. And who do they put at the top of the list? Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus is number one. And this is according to Time Magazine. Now, if you look over here, and you probably can see it more on the live stream than here, uh, the top six are right here. Napoleon... Muhammad, William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington, all of which had a high view of Jesus. For example, during his exile, Napoleon, who's on the number two on the list, said this, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. So the number two guy is looking straight up at the number one guy. Very interesting. Perhaps. I wasn't there. Um, number two, sorry, number three is Muhammad, right? The, numbers, the second biggest religion in history is Islam. The second most published holy book in history is the Quran. And the Quran and, and Muhammad see themselves as branching off from the Abrahamic faiths. So they root themselves in the Bible. And as a matter of fact, Muhammad saw himself, Moses, and Jesus as the three major prophets of God. So he said this, the Quran mentions Jesus numerous times, but here's an instance. When the angel said, O Mary, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him, whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, distinguished in this world and the hereafter and among those brought near. High view of Jesus, the only sinless prophet in Islam. Um, William Shakespeare said this, So Judas did to Christ, but he in twelve found truth in all but one. I in twelve thousand none. He's saying here, at least Jesus, I, William Shakespeare, couldn't find an honest person to support me my whole life. Jesus at least could find eleven. Okay, again, a high view of Jesus. And of course, if you look at Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, they were some of the political theorists behind the most Christianized society ever put on paper as a social, a social experiment, which is the Western world, and specifically the United States. Both were Christians, at least by, by vocalization, and both had a view of Jesus as being the Son of God. So in that list, if it's not Jesus, it's someone who has a high view of Jesus. Now, if I look at a world map by religious distribution, the purple, which covers the majority of the map, are countries whose official faith is Christianity. The peach color in the chunk in the middle here, top of Africa and the Middle East and, and Asia Minor, is Islam. So the Abrahamic faiths cover about 80% of the planet's surface. So if I was an alien who came to Earth and I looked at what was going on, I'd, the first question that I'd be like, well, Judeo-Christianity and these Abrahamic faith business, 
the biggest thing happening here, by far. It's like it's a one flavor planet, which we don't get the sense of that as Christians living in a post-Christian culture, but that is simply as a, as a cultural worldview phenomenon, there aren't a million different competitors. There really is a singular event happening. Now, to give you an example of what other holy books are like in terms of their creation, the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. Now, it is a single work. It's one book. It took two years to put together, and it was done by one author. Okay, so just get that in your mind. And the way he did it, by the way, jo Joseph Smith um, claimed that what happened is the angel Moroni appeared to him and brought him seven Egyptian plates, which he then translated, Joseph Smith, with the dubious act of what's called a seer stone. Now, this was a phenomenon, a folk, folk religious phenomenon in the 1800s, where you would cover your head with a cloth or a, shaw or a, a large hat and you would twist the gem, in the stone, in front of you and you interpret the glittering and write down what was written, <laughs> okay? This is the creation of the Book of Mormon. So he supposedly converted the seven Egyptian plates, which have never been found, given to him by an angel. It's always untestable, right? How do you test a supernatural phenomenon that came and went? And then he wrote down the manuscript of the Book of Mormon. He gave it to a publisher. Unfortunately, the publisher lost most of the manuscript. Fortunately, Joseph Smith has a stellar memory and he wrote most of it back from memory. So you can, you can stay safe or sure that Joseph Smith is on it. Okay, but this is what the creation of the Book of Mormon was. And what did the Book of Mormon um, position itself as to get credibility? Christianity. It's not a standalone religion. It's like a knockoff. You see, you know, you see Gucci, then you see Mucci, right? Someone knocks off a brand writing on the back of the brand's strength. That's what you're seeing with Mormonism. Um, let's look at the Quran. Again, the second biggest religious phenomenon. If you put the world population of Muslims, which is about 1.3 billion, plus the 2.1 billion Christians, if you in, 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 in put Catholics and Protestants in the same pool and Orthodox, you've got more than, you've got about two-thirds of the planet represented in those two faiths. Number two religious book in all of history is the Quran. It was created between 610 and 632. It's one single work. It took 22 years to write by a single author in his single lifetime, okay? And as we'll see, when you read the Quran, it is, the only history in the Quran is the stuff that piggybacks off the Old Testament about Moses and Pharaoh, some of the Jesus exploits, etc. It, does not, it is not written like a history book. The Bible, when you crack it open, pretty much anywhere in the whole book, is consistently written as history. This king was in this city reigning during this other king's reign. This was I mean, all the quote-unquote painfully detailed lineages of family lines, etc. Okay? So this is the second most impactful and popular religious text in history. Compare this with the creation, a schematic on the time frame of the Bible. Now, Job it was written during the age of the patriarch. It's older than the books of Moses, by the way. That's the accepted view in, amongst theologians. You're looking at uh, 66 books over a 2,000 year span for the writing of it. The history it covers is larger than 2,000 years and at least 40 different authors. And again, written as history. So this is what the yellow bar at the bottom here is what 2,000 year timeline looks like. Compare that to a 22 year, that little yellow blip right there. So in a span, the, the amount of time it took to write the Quran, you could have written 100 Qurans in a 2,000 year period. And in a two year span for the, you guys see that little dash of the yellow right there? That's two years. You could write 1,000 books of Mormon in a 2,000 year period. This is the difference between the Judeo-Christian holy book and the next in line, the Quran. Quran, by the way, writing on the coattails of Abrahamic faiths as far as credibility. Now, Book of Mormon attempted to write about history. For example, the origin of the American population according to the Book of Mormon is that in about 600 BC, 
Middle Eastern men sailed to Central America and populated the Americas from there. There was nobody here before them. Now, if you look at molecular anthropology, genetics, and just regular anthropology, so through archaeology and molecular anthropology, it has come to f we've come to find out that the people who populated the Americas came through the Siberian Straits. Genetically, archaeologically, culturally, linguistically, we've proven that. So in light of science and archaeology, this has been proven false. Uh, the Book of Mormon also says that in the... In six, by 600 BC, here in North, in North and South America, there were things such as silk, wheat, steel, cattle, pigs, coins, etc. All of which were brought by Europeans in the 1400s AD, 2,000 years after the event. So in light of history, again, a big X. You know in, the, in Jeopardy? Right? It is difficult to write fake history because you can be found out to be lying. Right? And when you have, they only tried a little bit of history in the Book of Mormon and they still failed. Imagine if the entire holy book, 40 plus different authors, over 66 different books in 2,000 year time span, how hard would it be if you're making it up to get your story straight? Let alone, not just a historical accuracy, but just a consistent narrative would be near impossible. Um, Islam, a former Christian turned Muslim had uh, called Louis, sorry, Louis Fatuhi says it very succinctly. Those who are familiar with the style of the Bible get it surprised and even baffled when they read a translation of the Quran. Unlike the Bible, which addresses most issues in the context of relating history, the Quran is not a history book. The Quran is written in the style of like Proverbs and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes what we call the books of wisdom, where we just pontificate about what the right thing to do is. You can, I guess, test that out by living your life according to those principles. And in a sense, if you look at countries around the world who were based upon Muslim theocracy, how are they doing compared to the West, right? M many waves of refugees from imploding Muslim countries have been unleashed, and where do they usually migrate to? Other Muslim countries? the West, right? We've tried out the, 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 the ideologies of both books. One of them seems to be succeeding quite well. But either way, the Quran is one man's pontifications. It's not very testable, because today it's all about archaeology this evening. Now, let's switch to Judeo-Christianity. The events in Judeo-Christianity span three continents, took 2,000 years to write, uh, there's thousands of years of family lines described name by name. And, uh-oh, Justin, help. Um, and again, it's littered with people, places, events, etc. Right? It is not a pontification book. There's a small exception in our Bible called the Books of Wisdom, but it is the rest of the, the genre of the Bible is history. Right? And therefore, the one thing that that makes the Bible is what? testable. You can objectively test it. And for the last 200 years, we've had a science in the West known as archaeology and anthropology. And yes, it makes the Bible testable. So let's zero in on the book of Exodus to start off. Uh, by the way, Herodotus is considered, for some reason, the world's first historian. He's a Greek uh, his, historian. He wrote histories in 430 BC, of which we have some uh, evidence of. And the funny thing is, a thousand years before this was a book written, and the reason he's called the father of history is because the way he wrote. But the thing is, his style of writing is exactly like the five books of Moses, right? And the book of histories, Joshua and Kings, Second Kings Chronicles. Why isn't the Bible considered the first book of history, right? It's interesting. Now, if you look at the Exodus, in Exodus we're told that Joseph came to Egypt, his family followed him, and then they established a colony there that grew over 400 years, right? Now if you look, and it's called the city of Ramses, often in the Old Testament. Now the city of Ramses is in a northern part of uh, Egypt, in northern Africa, called the Goshen region. And there is settlement underneath the layer where the city of Ramses is found there, 
In a layer beneath it is the settlement of Averis, which would have been the name of the area when the Jews began to populate. And there's evidence that they are Semitic peoples, the burial practices, the animals they kept, etc. There was a group of Semitic people which for a season formed a wealthy class of merchants. Okay, that's what the archaeology says. Um, for example, in the Goshen, in the Semitic neighborhood in Goshen, there is a unique phenomenon. There's houses built in the Syrian style. Now, Israel had never existed as, as a nation at this point, as its own nation and culture. So everyone that made up the patriarchal lineage, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons, were Canaanites, culturally speaking, right? Syrian, Phoenician, Canaanites. So there's Syrian-style housing all over this otherwise. It'd be like going across the street and seeing all uh, Japanese-style housing in a whole neighborhood, right? Evidence of a Japanese influence. Now, this particular house in, part of, in the Semitic part of the neighborhood of Goshen all of a sudden is torn down, and on top of it, a... Uh-oh. Justin. Oh, there you are. On top of this... Syrian style houses is demolished and a, in the neighborhood of Semitic people is a palace erected in the style of a Egyptian high official. Does that sound familiar to, does that seem friendly to the biblical narrative of Joseph being the basically prime minister's right hand man, right? Can't prove it, his name's not written anywhere there, but there's the evidence right there. Now in the courtyard of the um, in the courtyard of the same palace that I'm going to show you in a second happens to be 12 official mausoleums. Does that sound familiar? One of the mausoleums, interestingly enough, so there's the, oops, there is the Egyptians officials house. There's 12 mausoleums, one of which is done in the style of a high Egyptian official. If you look inside of it, there is a gentleman whose red hair and white skin is the way Egyptians depicted non-Egyptians, what they call the northern people, which would have included the Canaanites. And guess what he's sporting this particular statue? A multicolored coat. <laughs> it doesn't say Joseph anywhere on there, but uh, it's looking a little Josephy. Now, in there's a man-made canal next to the Nile called, to this day, the Waterway of Joseph. All right, one more layer of coincidence, right? Um, if you look at the wealth distribution around what would have been the time of Joseph, you see that for a long period of time, before the New Kingdom period of Joseph's time, uh, this, the size of these statues on the Egyptian map here is the fact that there was a fairly equivalently distributed wealth and power amongst leaders in different regions of Egypt. It was a decentralized power structure. A little bit after that period, there's a concentration of wealth into one major leader in Egypt. Very similar in timing to what would have probably been the time of Joseph's life. This does mirror the narrative in Exodus of the famine, which Joseph predicted by, by interpreting the dream of the Pharaoh. And they stored all seven years of earth of abundance. And it says in the Exodus narrative that once... The, the famine hit for seven years. People in the region had to come to this particular pharaoh to do what? To survive, to buy bread. And they sold, they used money at first, then they sold their livestock, and then they finally gave their land because it was better to be poor than dead. So there was a concentration of power at this point, which again mirrors the biblical narrative. Uh, burial practices, as you can see in the Goshen district, is of Semitic people. The tools, everything is Canaanite, Syrian in culture, non-Egyptian. Non and again, at first, uh, the livestock as well. At first, wealthy. And then something bad happens. The Semitic presence takes a huge downturn in health and wealth. Um, do you guys know what Harris lines are? Because they've, de they've taken remains from that area and x-rayed them. And there's a phenomenon when you have malnutrition, uh, you see the ridging in this femoral bone of a juvenile, the, the, the dark and white lines. When you're not eating consistently in your growing years, you have periods of nutrition and non-nutrition alternating. It's usually seasonal, perhaps. 
And so you have healthy bone and then b low bone density in alternating fashion throughout the months and years. This is a sign of impoverishment. So now the Semitic peoples, according to the archaeological record, have taken a huge downturn. Again, it says in the biblical narrative that after Joseph's lifetime, there came a time when the Pharaoh did no longer remember Joseph, and he was afraid the Jews were prospering, and they were a threat to the power structure in Egypt, so they were what? Enslaved. And they had a period of hundreds of years of hardship, 200 plus years of hardship. Um, it just so happens around that time that 50% of child deaths are before the age of two. This would have been around the time of Moses. So does this perhaps mirror the notion that at one point, even under the oppressiveness of slavery, the Jews were still being blessed by God, and what did the Pharaoh say? The reverse of the Chinese one-child policy, which says kill the girls. Pharaoh said to the Egyptian midwives, throw the baby boys in the water. Don't want them to survive. And it happens to be also that the populace of the Semitics in that, ta in that area shows an unnatural distribution of more female to male ratio. Similar, by the way, of what's happening in China in reverse, right? Even when you try and kill every last one of a gender, it, it's hard to get a much of an imbalance because if you flip a coin a million times, you'll hit heads and tails 50-50. To get a 60-40-70-30 split is an unnatural injection, non-natural, not disease-based. It's usually geopolitical, right? Like the one-child policy in China. Evidence, again, in the archaeological, anthropological record that does, is friendly to the biblical narrative. Um, there's something known as the Brooklyn Papyri, and it's a list of a wealthy Egyptian household and its list of slaves, all Semitic names. So once a wealthy merchant class, now the Semitic population in that area is the servant class. Something changed. Then, parting of the sea. Is there any evidence supporting the parting of the Red Sea? Uh, first of all, there's many theories as to where that was, right? We're, we're going to take questions and answers afterwards. Um, parting of the Red Sea. That's the next event in the Exodus record. Now, it says God explicitly, explicitly tells Moses to do what? Do not take the way of the Philistine, which was the highway on the northern edge on the Mediterranean. That leaves two natural topographic highways. The middle one here, and then this lower one here that goes across the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, which is right here. You can't see the base of it, but there's the Sinai Peninsula. And Midian, the land of Midian is over here. Moses had spent 40 years in exile where? The land of Midian, where his father-in-law was. And that's where he had the burning bush moment. So there is a very good likelihood that when Moses is told by God at the burning bush, go get my people, he thought, well, or maybe he was even instructed, bring him back here. This is our new home base where the bushes talk to you, right? Where God manifests himself. So there's a very good chance that they took this lower route across here. Now you can't see it on this map, but topographically you can't just walk, it's not a flat plateau. It's an incredibly mountainous region. So you have to follow lines and crevices naturally built into the mountain range. So if you look over here, this is an actual satellite map of the Sinai Peninsula. This bay right here is an extension of the Red Sea. Okay, It's called Yam Suf is what we translated to Red Sea in the uh, Septuagint. Okay, uh, Yam Suf in 1 Kings is listed as, in 1 Kings it says Solomon created at Ezion Geber a naval port right there at the outer reach of the kingdom of the Edomites, which is literally the kingdom of the Edomites triangles at its base right into here. And it says next to the Yom Suf. So the Bible itself, and, it, and Yom Suf is what the Exodus account says is where we crossed, the Israelites crossed. So we have a good clue as to where this crossing happened. Now it can happen in a variety of places, but again, Carved into the rock are only a handful of options of where two million, including old people and infants, where they could have gone to, right? Because you've got mountain ranges as high as 7,000 feet in this plateau, right? You're going to go on solid ground in the mountainous terrain. And it's literally, and it says they were imprisoned in the wilderness. At one point, God tells Moses in the Exodus narrative, take a detour. So he was going to follow the highway all the way across here back to Midian, which is over here. 
At one point, God says, turn back and go a different route for whatever reason. Right here is this plateau. Or oh, right, sorry, another key, another clue within scripture of where this, this crossing might have taken place. When God tells Moses where the boundaries of the promised land will be, he uses as one of the indicators from Yom Suf, from the borders of Yom Suf to the Sea of the Philistines. Now that hard edge drawn across these two border marks is the ancient boundary of Israel. In all your biblical maps, you'll see it. It's still the boundary to this day, okay? So again, this most likely was the area in this region where the crossing of the Red Sea took place. Now, sorry, this little nugget I was pointing to right here, which is one of the only options of where you can go if you don't go over the Yom Suf, is a mountainous route that dumps you off in this beachhead right there. Now you get there, and it says in Scripture unequivocally, they were trapped, right? And it, this was a 10 to 23 day journey. It makes sense of the biblical narrative when you realize it would take a couple of weeks. I mean, Pharaoh was traumatized after the 10 plagues, lets the Egyptians go. And then finally he's sitting there, and then all of a sudden it probably dawns on him, a few days go by, a week, a week and a half. Uh, what's going to happen to our economy? The workforce is like gone. This is going to be a problematic thing because in the historical record, by the way, this was a turning point in the military power of the new kingdom of Egypt. Okay, they lost, and there's records of it in other cultures. They took a huge downturn, and every culture feared the Israelites after this stage. It's, we see it all over scripture. Whenever the Jews encounter people in, the, in their wilderness journey, what do the, people, what do the Jews say? They were afraid of the Jews because of what they had done to the, Israel, uh, to the, to the most powerful people on earth at the time. Okay, so let's theoretically say they're stuck here, and then the Pharaoh says, you know what, we got to get them back, or we're going to go bankrupt. So off he goes to get them. So there they are, they're at the beach, and now this also happens to be topographically the only place in the region, if you remove the water from that gulf, it's the only place with a land bridge going across it. Okay, because off to the sides there's deep water trenches that are like 2,800 feet. You're not going in there with old people. You have to have mountain climbing equipment to get through that. So, for example, there's been four different spots along that bay that's been suggested. The beachhead one up here at the top is the only one whose gradient would allow for not only travel by foot, but chariots, which because Pharaoh went in hot pursuit. You're not going through this. This is like going up and down Mount Finlayson, okay? The most reasonable place to assume was this area right there. It's consistent. In other words, the biblical narrative is consistent with the topography. Okay? Now, in the people of, unfortunately, that area is highly politically charged. It's very hard for archaeological outfits to get the rights to go and explore that place. And they're not allowed to take a single thing. There's no excavation. There's no removal of anything they find. So all they can do is film and watch. And I've seen some of the footage. Now, one thing they'll say is that a natural coral reef formation is very obvious to a marine biologist diver. They know what natural reef formations are. What they do show is that in, in there's a, it looks in one section of the area where the land bridge was that we just showed you, like there was a, ship, a shipwreck and a whole bunch of debris fell everywhere. Because it says that the Pharaoh and his army sank like stones in the mighty waters, in the depth of the mighty waters. The waters closed in over them after the Jews had crossed. So they would be, there would be an Egyptian army with chariots, armor, everything littered through the bottom of the sea floor. Now, unfortunately, that was 3,500 years ago. Wood and organic matter like bones and skin does not last in water. The, the marine uh, biology eats it up, corrodes it, gets rid of it. The only way you can preserve something is the same way you can preserve fossils in an above-ground scenario, when it's buried at death. So it's possible that some of that stuff was buried when the waters smashed back together, but they would not be on the surface of the ocean floor like it is here. But the theory in some of these areas is you're seeing very strange formations that fit the pattern, coral formations, that fit the pattern of things like chariots. Again, totally unproven, totally theoretical. I don't know what to make of it, but here it is. Um, yeah, so they've drawn that out. There's a, it's coral reefs in the shape of an Egyptian chariot, possibly. Um, in areas where 
this is actually, this is a little deceitful. This is a overlaid drawing of a uh, chariot wheel with spikes and hubs and rims over what seems to be a coral formation that is built like it. One thing they did, the one diver said he did is he goes, you can set your metal detector to be very dull because there's trace minerals of, of ore and iron in coral reefs. So it, you, you just set it to its high sensitivity and your metal detector will trigger off anything. But if you dull it and then you go and you follow the rim and they find, they can actually trace out readings that seem to corroborate that there's iron inside the coral reef. Again, because of politics, they cannot remove anything or disturb any of the coral reef formation. So this is all speculative. Um, they found human femurs down there. But if this human femur was from 3,500 years ago, I don't see, unless it was dug up from, the, from a buried position, I don't see how it could have survived that long. So we're not supposed, I'm not surprised we don't have a litany of evidence um, ba based on the timing in which this, uh, this occurred underwater. Um, yes, and right, this is the land bridge where they would have crossed theoretically. Right off to here, could easily have, the current could easily have dragged a whole bunch of that stuff over time into an area far too deep to, and it has not been explored yet. So, moving on. So when they get to the promised land, what's the first place they conquer? Jericho. And Joshua takes the army, they conquer Jericho. Some interesting things about that archaeologically is... It's uncontroversial that, for example, there's a two-wall structure found in Jericho's remains. Now, an archaeologist in the last century uh, discovered, it says in the biblical record that right after they conquered Jericho, what did they do? They held a Passover meal, which means what? It was in springtime, which would have been, um, their harvest would have come and gone. Now, the, the pots, whoops. The pots of grain found in Jericho were full. That means there was a lightning quick siege. It didn't last, what does, siege usually last what? Months to years. Because what are you doing with a siege? You're trying to avoid a fight. You're trying to starve the people inside of a walled city out. They can't go out and farm. They can't receive, uh, they can't buy and sell wheat. You've closed them off. It's usually what you see after a successful siege is a completely depleted and fa impoverished and famished inside the city. So whatever took place in here, the destruction was sudden, the wall's destruction was sudden, and there was a full grain stores inside. So whatever happened, the siege was lightning quick. Does that seem friendly to you to the Joshua account? Of course. It was a lightning quick, you know, seven day siege, right? Plenty of food to be left over. Um, a German archaeologist discovered this. On the outside wall, in the wall, were several actual, like it was a residential area. You could live in the wall of Jericho. There's only one segment of the wall in Jericho that was not destroyed when the wall was destroyed. Does that sound familiar, right? Potentially, because in the biblical narrative, Rahab is living in the wall, so she sends out a, a scarlet uh, linen to show the Israelites, this is my home, leave us alone. It looks like not even, not just the Jews left her alone, it seems like God left her alone, didn't destroy her house. Again, Speculation, but backed with evidence. Um, Ezekiel. Ezekiel uh, was, during the conquest of Babylon of, of, of Israel, Ezekiel was taken into exile, or was, was living through the exile period. He prophesied that at the time, one of the big power structures on earth was the Phoenician world. What was one of the capitals of Phoenicia? The city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. At one point, Ezekiel prophesies specifically against Tyre. And he says, and by the way, at the time, before Alexander the Great's time, there was a island city. This is the Mediterranean, by the way. This is the coastline in what's modern day Lebanon. There was the island city of Tyre about a half kilometer offshore. And there was the mainland city of Tyre. You gotta remember that. Nebuchadnezzar did a 13 year siege against the mainland city hoping to get the leaders hiding in the island city to give up the goods. They didn't. He didn't successfully totally destroy the power structure. Um, in the Ezekiel prophecy, it says, I will bring many nations against you. And it says, like the waves of the sea. So a, a constant blow. And throughout the history of this city has been a series of unfortunate events befalling it. 
including Nebuchadnezzar, who represents Babylon, and Alexander the Great alone, these are the two major sieges, um, was a voluntary army representing, se- the, the nations involved in Alexander's army retained their, ethni- their ethnic identity. They saw themselves as individual nations. So just between those two that we know for sure about are waves of nations attacking them. And in our era, that ADs, the Arab nations also had waves of conquest in Tyre. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was, pro- there was a prophecy specifically about Nebuchadnezzar and Ezekiel, and it says that he would destroy the mainland, which is primarily what he did. It also said that he would impoverish them, take their spoil, and take away their daughters, etc. Precisely, more or less, what he did do. Um, he failed to capture the island city. It kind of implies that in the prophecy, if you look at it a certain way. And there was a, amongst archaeologists and anthropologists, they poo-pooed the idea because there was no evidence for a while that Nebuchadnezzar had ever done anything to Tyre until they found an engravement in Babylon of the people and the kings in the, that they had conquered and had taken back to Babylon in exile. Who was at the top of the list? The king of Tyre. Okay, so they took, Babylon was in the, in the habit of when they conquered something, they took the high and mighty and the upper class back to Babylon to gut the power structure, to behead the civilizations they conquered. Uh, Rome, by the way, stopped doing that. They began to go, you know what, that's expensive, because then we leave behind a ruined civilization. If we just put tax posts in these cities, let them run their economy and their religion and their stuff, we just tax them, right? That's why Pontius Pilate was not... This was the, the procurator of Rome in Judea. Um, specifically, two other aspects of the prophecy. I will throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. Okay? And I will make you a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets. This is in the five, or sorry, the 400, sorry, the 500s BC, by the way. 200 years after this prophecy, a gentleman by the name of Alexander the Great came to town. Now, what he did is he was not messing around. Um, He was homeschooled, by the way, and one of his major teachers was Aristotle. So just because you're homeschooled, your kids doesn't mean they won't become tyrants. He took every stone and piece of lumber on the mainland city, dumped it into the ocean to create a causeway 200 feet wide, a half a mile long, to get just to march his army to the island. He wasn't going to wait like Nebuchadnezzar did for 13 years. He goes, I want you now. And he did. Now as a result of that, that's that's embedded on the sea floor. So it took all the edifices of Tyre and literally scraped it into the ocean 200 years after the prophecy. And to this day, modern day in Lebanon, Tyre looks like this. A sandbar has built up over time because of Alexander's causeway. And as a result, it completely buried, both on the mainland and most of the island, all the edifices from the era of Ezekiel. Because it says in the prophecy as well, I will completely destroy you, you will never be found, you will never be again rebuilt. Now obviously over time they've rebuilt other cities, Greco-Roman cities and now modern day Lebanon cities, but the, 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 the prophecy can be looked at this way. If I prophesied against New York and I said, New York, you will be utterly destroyed and there will be nothing remaining. New York as we know it now has the Statue of Liberty, the World Trade Center, the Empire State Building, etc. It has landmarks. If it was completely destroyed and another city was built on it later that looked nothing like it, the New York I was prophesying against would have successfully been erased. Does that make sense? Right? Um, in 1291 AD, the uh, Mameluke Muslims came, and again, as they, the, the Muslims invaded it twice, the last time in 1291, taking it back from the Crusaders, and this time they said, we're going to take everything away from here that would ever get the Crusaders to want to come back. So another full wave of total destruction. They took most of the Greco-Roman era uh, architecture and stuff away. There's still some that remains. Um, again, several... Several anthropologists and archaeologists of the highest order have said it's impossible to find more or less anything from Ezekiel's era in Tyre, which fulfills the prophecy. Um, This is from about a hundred, up until about a hundred years ago, uh, this was Tyre. Does that look like a bare rock to you? Like it said in the prophecy? We just, Lebanon just started trying to make it into the last 50, 60 years, started developing it to make it into a tourist destination. But for a long time, 
Wasn't much going on there. And guess what was a common activity on the south shore of the, of the, of the sandbar? Fishermen trying their nets. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? All right, Nehemiah. So 100 years later, Nehemiah gets the go-ahead from Artaxerxes to rebuild. The temple had been rebuilt in Jerusalem. The commerce was starting up again. People were moving back. But what did Jerusalem lack at this point? A wall. And in those days, no wall around your city is like a house with no... If, you're, if you've got a contractor build you a house and you show up and you're like, no windows, no doors. And he's like, yeah, yeah, well, it's mostly done. Well, no, I can't live there until there's windows and doors. Same thing with the ancient cities. You had to have a protective wall. So, in the tale of Nehemiah, who were the three main bad guys? Who were the three stooges that he kept having to, who were, who were oppressing him and sending people to fight them? And they were so worried for their lives, they had to have shovels and tools in one hand and a, basically the equivalent of a Glock on the other because they were under constant threat, right? The three bad guys are Geshem, Senbalat, and Tobiah. Uh, if you go to the Brooklyn Museum, you'll find a bowl, with a, a silver bowl with an inscription around the edge that says Geshem uh, from Qadar. Qadar is what? It's part of the Arabian Kingdom at that time. What is Geshem called in the book of Nehemiah? Geshem the Arabian. So this is evidence of the actual person. Um, there is an elephantine papyrus in the Brooklyn Museum, and it mentions Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, which exactly what Nehemiah positions him as. Uh, Josephus, the historian, also corroborates that Sanballat was made governor of Samaria. And lastly is Tobiah's family palace has been unearthed. His name's written several places on that structure and in a nearby burial cave. This was Tobiah the Ammonite's actual, and he was a heavy player in the day. The three bad guys were the equivalent of like, uh, who was one of the Palestinian leaders in the last 20 years? What was his name? Yeah, Yasser Arafat. These guys, are, it's funny, you read the account of Nehemiah, and it's the same thing happening in Israel today. The regions around Israel, constantly antagonistic, their major leadership, constantly antagonistic to Israel. We're going to launch into the New Testament and then we will be done. So to give you an example of what's typical in ancient biographies, here's Alexander the Great, lived in the 300s BC. The, early, the only works we have of his life come from the last century BC and the first century AD, three and four hundred years after his life. Now we don't actually have those copies from that time. The earliest copy we have is from 700 AD, which is a thousand years from, G from um, Alexander's lifetime. The writers of his biography are called tertiary sources. For me to be a pri primary source is obviously the best for history. For me to have a primary source, I have to either have eyewitness the event, like a journalist being at the Hindenburg, Hindenburg uh, um, accident, or be alive in the time in which it happened. Both are considered primary sources. So I could write about 9-11, having never seen it with my own eyes, only seen it on TV, and my work would still be considered historically as a primary source. Now, if in 100 years somebody found my work and quoted it, they would be a secondary source. Now, if both of those were, if mine was lost, but theirs remained, and the somebody in another generation found the secondary source and quoted it, that would be a tertiary source. So we have no primary and no secondary source work for Alexander, only tertiary. Compare that to the New Testament. So here's Jesus' lifetime, probably dead around the 4th century AD. Didn't stay dead, don't get me wrong. But his life on earth ended in the 4th century AD. And everything in the New Testament is by, is it primary or secondary source work? It's primary, okay? So are the historical sources that are non-biblical about Jesus, and so we'll see those in just a second. So within 20 years of his lifetime, all four Gospels, well, all three Gospels, John probably came in 90 AD, the Gospels were written, okay, by people who had lived with and, at, or, and or at the time of Jesus. The Gospel were all eyewitness accounts. Even the Gospel of Mark, Mark was Peter's secretary, Mark is really the gospel of Peter, okay? 
So then, the, what's the oldest copy we have of the New Testament? It's dating around 125 AD, and it's a, cop, it's a chunk of John, chapter 17, which was written in 90 AD. So we're looking at less than a 50-year difference, not a 1,000 years. Primary sources, less than 50 years from the oldest document we still have today, okay? And none of these are just tertiary, secondary. What, these are all primary sources we have for the New Testament. So again, less than 100 years between the, origin, the last source we have, the oldest source of the New Testament we still possess, and the life of Jesus, less than 100 years. Okay, compare that to Alexander the Great. Name me one university professor you've ever heard critique. Do we really know Alexander the Great lived? Do we really know what he did? No, it's taken for fact, the history of Alexander the Great's military conquest in his life. No one questions it. If we don't question that, we should not be questioning the New Testament in terms of its historical validity. Okay, so if I take a list of people, this is all extra biblical. So I'm going to look at guys that have nothing to do with Christianity but lived in the first century A.D. So there's a gentleman by the name of Tacitus. This is a gentleman by the name of Suetonius, both of which are official secretaries to the Roman emperors. This is Pliny the Younger, another secretary to the Roman. And these next two guys are Trajan and Hadrian. Those were actual Roman emperors. Uh, here's a satirist or a comedian, a non-believing comedian by the name of Lucian. Uh, this is Marabar Serapion, a Greek official. This is the Toledoth Hezu Jewish text. This is the most famous first century historian, Jew working for Rome, Josephus, Josephus Flavius, Flavius Josephus. And here is the Talmud, uh, text from the Talmud. I'm only going to use those. That's not the New Testament. But these are all, because they lived in the time of Jesus, they're primary and secondary sources. Some of them were not, uh, were born right after Jesus' life. So we're talking primary and secondary Roman, Jewish, and Greek sources on the, the, bur the burgeoning Christian movement. Just using those, I can recreate the following facts. A man named Jesus was tortured and crucified by Pontius Pilate during the time of Tiberius' reign. Jesus' followers worshipped him as a god and were rumored to gather and partake of, of food and perhaps drink blood, an obvious misunderstanding of communion. Jesus' followers were named Christians and they were willing to die for their quote-unquote superstition. Emperors such as Nero and Pliny regularly tortured and killed Christians. The superstition of the Christians was contagious and it was decreasing the activity of competing religions. Furthermore, people of all ages and classes were joining the movement. It wasn't a niche movement, it was a universal human movement. Christians were known for their moral behavior and their unjust torture and execution sometimes stirred compassion from the general public. And finally, the location of Jesus' tomb was known and was indeed found empty after his death and burial. All of this compatible with New Testament views on Jesus. Now one thing you'll find is you'll often hear the saying that, oh well, you know, the super, Jesus might have been a historical guy, but you know what? It was embellished over time, right? Who here was alive when Gandhi was alive? I wasn't. He was assassinated in 1938. I, I, all of my information, if I talk about Gandhi, I'm a secondary historical source. Have you heard anybody, is, there, is the mainstream belief about Gandhi that he was a supernatural miracle worker who raised from the dead? No. How about John F. Kennedy? It is extremely hard, it takes a very long time to begin to, it takes at least two generations to begin to erode core details of a, of a historical character's life. Unlike the theory that there's an embellishment around Jesus, making him supernatural over time, the exact reverse is true. It took centuries to secularize Jesus. The earliest source work about Jesus is as the, those who followed him and died for following him believed him he was God. That was the, the ideological center, white-hot center, 
of the primary generation that lived with Jesus' belief about Jesus. All good historical information about Jesus, all primary historical sources about Jesus, have him as a supernatural miracle worker. The embellishment worked in reverse. He was de-embellished over time. Um, Gnostic Gospels, you've heard of that because the Dan Brown novels. Well, no Gnostic Gospel was written in the century of Jesus' life, all second century and beyond. As goofy as they are, they still have a view of Jesus that is supernatural and very consistent and compatible with the New Testament, right? Yet again, no sign of him not having a supernatural reputation, even in the weird Gospels. Early fathers, be, the, the, the apostles had students, right? Ignatius, Clement of Rome, etc. The generation of students of the apostles and onwards, they're the students, students, so on and so forth, from the time of the apostles till the Council of Nicaea in 324 AD is a period known as the Church Fathers, okay? What did they believe? They wrote a ton of letters to each other and we have them all. So they produce a bunch of extra biblical accounts of incidentary details about Jesus' youth and, and where he traveled as a young man, etc. There's extra information in there, but... When you take, if you take, they quoted the Gospels to each other, they quoted, they quoted the New Testament to each other. If I took a pair of scissors and I cut out just their quotes of the New Testament and put them in a scrapbook, I could recreate the entire New Testament except for 11 verses, okay? And this is all before the Council of Nicaea because one of the theories you have is that the Council of Nicaea is when they invented the Bible. I don't know about that because there's chunks of John 200 years before the council, and in the years before the council, in the centuries before the council, I've got people writing, the, quoting the Bible and recreating it for me, okay? Not only that, we have what's called the Muratorian Canon Fragment. Now, this is dating to about 170 AD, and it li lists the books of our New Testament exactly in the order we have it. So 150 years before the Council of Nicaea, we had our New Testament. Now, there is an exception. There's three books missing. However, those books are quoted during that time period by the church fathers. So the idea that they weren't around at the time, not correct. Okay? So the Muratorian canon fragment is another thing to know about. Oops. To give you an example of the strength of the amount, because the number of manuscripts, how early they are, how close they are to the events they describe all matter. So in the top seven of historical ancient texts, uh, here you have Caesar's accounts of the Gaelic Wars. Now it was written sometime between 44 and 100 BC. The oldest copy we still have today that we can go and look at with our own eyes is in 900 AD. That's about a thousand years difference, right? And there's roughly 10 manuscripts, okay? That's par for the course in the bottom third of the top uh, seven. Uh, Thucydides' historical work, 400 BC, 900 AD is the earliest copy, that's 1300 years difference, only eight manuscripts. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, Homer's Iliad is the silver medalist, he's in second place. And Homer's Iliad was written in 900 BC. Uh, first copy we still possess is from 400 BC, that's only 500 years, which is very good in ancient history. And we have hundreds of manuscripts uh, of this particular work. And remember, things like all these guys were official historians of the, um, or official scholars of their civilizations. In other words, their works were translated by a group of professional scribes paid for by government. The way we would do the Bible now. You don't just happenstance, willy-nilly, pen the Bible down yourself. It's done by official committees to make sure what? The message is preserved. For its first hundreds of years, the Bible was an underground movement and no one was overseeing the transcription of the Bible, the New Testament, nobody. It was going on literally happenstance, okay? And that, keep that in mind when we look at um, the accuracy of the transmission. What's in first place, do you think? I'll give you one guess. What's the most well-established book of ancient history? The New Testament. Again, written between 40 and 100 A.D., 
Earliest copies date uh, theories range from 70 to 125. That means 25 to 50 years from the time of its actual original writing and a copy we could still look at today. That is oh, that's 20 times better than the second place finisher. And the number of manuscripts is sky high, over 20,000. Okay? Those, that's the numbers game when it comes to our New Testament. Um, just to give you an example, this is the Greek, about 5,300 manuscripts, Latin, 10,000, and it's 5,300 over here, sorry, 9.3, 9,300 in various other languages. In the first 500 years of Christianity, the New Testament had spread to three continents and several languages. If you take that original, before we started to officially, scribally oversee the transmission of our scriptures, we had hundreds of years where it was telephone tag. You know the telephone game, you just whisper something in your buddy's ear? You would think all hell would break loose on the accuracy of the, of the, of the transcription. Less than 0.5% differences across all languages, all continents, all hundreds of years. That's unheard of. That's not natural. That's not what would happen typically, right? And the differences, by the way, are things like somebody omits this word because of a language difference. No, no change in the message whatsoever. You'll sometimes hear that there's, oh, there's over 100,000 variants. What they mean by that is, let's say that there's a thread of manuscripts that are copied from the same original thread. If there's a different word or an omitted word in the original, it's photocopied through all the lineage of that manuscript. They count each one of those. That's cheating, because it's one, it's one difference multiplied artificially. Does that make sense? Uh, internal cues as to the early date writing of the Gospels. Um, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, one of his major prophecies. Happened in AD 70, we know that from history. Is it anywhere in the scriptures? No. Would they have made a point of writing about that? I think more likely, yes. They talk about Stephen's martyrdom in the book of Acts, the first official martyr of Christianity, besides the Lord. AD 64, Nero persecutes the church. We don't hear of it in Acts. 62, James is martyred. 64, Paul's martyred. 65, Peter's martyred. None of them are in the, in the, Old Test in the New Testament. Something tells me they would have been noted as leaders of the church. Nothing. So it had to, the creation of the Acts, Luke, and the other Gospels, and the Epistles would predate, obviously Paul's letters had to predate Paul's death. Everything's in the, fifth, uh, the, the 50s or earlier. Um, archaeology. There is, Luke refers to Lysanias as being the Tetrarch of Abilene at the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, which had been about 27 AD, Luke 3.1. Historians accused Luke of being wrong because the only Lysanias we used to know of from history was one that was killed in 36 BC. That's not the right timing. But now we found an inscription near Damascus in this area that happens to stay on it. Era sorry, Friedman of Lysanias the Tetrarch, and it's dated between 14 and 29 AD. So we have a Lysanias that matches. Um, Paul writes to the Romans and he speaks to the city, in, in Romans, he speaks to the city treasurer Erastus. Happens to be a plaque in Corinth that says, Erastus, curator of public buildings, laid this pavement at his own expense. Luke mentions a riot in Ephesus. Uh, took place near a theater, Acts 19, 23 to 41. The theater Luke mentions has been excavated. Has a, it's an amphitheater, Roman amphitheater, and it seats 25,000. Acts 21 records an incident which broke out between Paul and certain Jews from Asia, Asia in the Jewish temple back uh, in Jerusalem. Um, the theater has now, sorry, there's a, there's a stone that says the following. This would, this would have been a stone that would have been at the Jerusalem temple. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to thank for his ensuing death. So if you were a non-Jew entering, the, penetrating the borders of the, the uh, non-Gentile gate at the Herod's temple, death penalty, which makes sense of there being quite a row between Paul and his Greek guest if they, if they were found to be within the borders of the temple. Um, Luke addresses Gallio with the title proconsul. 
Uh, at the Oracle of Delphi, which is this thing right here, we see an inscription that states, Lucius Junius Gallio, my friend and proconsul of Achaia. Again, these are details, but this is what happens when you're loaded with details, titles, names, people, places, and events. If you're lying, like Joseph Smith was, you get caught. If you're telling the truth, you're repeatedly testable and vindicated. Um, the five porticos of the pool of Beth Bethesda by the Sheep Gate and the pool of Siloam mentioned in John 5 and 9 have been unearthed. The pavement or Gabbatha of John 18, 13, which is where Jesus' trial took place, has been discovered. And Solomon's porch in the temple precincts has also been found. Um, Jacob's well at Sychar from John 4 has also been found. Um, in Caesarea, by the way, there was a long time, up until last century, we had no evidence of Pilate's existence, right? So what's, what do the critics say? Bible made it up. Well, we found an inscription saying Pontius Pilate's the procurator of Judea, okay? We also found the Pilate ring. It's his ring with his insignia and his name is on it. Uh, even the New York Times admits that that's the Pilate ring. We are home stretch here. Uh, bone from the, from the first century of a calcaneous bone, a heel bone with a nail through it, showing the crucifixion style of Romans was consistent with the biblical narrative. And guess whose actual bone box tomb we found from that era? High priest Caiaphas. Caiaphas, who put our Lord on the cross, thinking he was going to sacrifice one man to save the peace between Rome and Jew, uh, Israel, he's still in his box. Jesus isn't. We win. Uh, Sir William Ramsey was considered one of the world's greatest archaeologists. He believed that the New Testament, particularly Luke and Acts, were second century forgeries. He spent 30 years in Asia Minor seeking to dig up enough evidence to prove that Luke and Acts was nothing more than fiction. Unfortunately for his disbelief, after his long journey, he was compelled to admit that the New Testament was a first century compilation and that the Bible is historically reliable. It led to his conversion and embraced the very faith he once saw as a hoax. One of his quotes is, quote unquote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Luke is unsurpassed in respects of its trustworthiness. Another skeptic, uh, Nelson Gluick, here on Time Magazine. Here's what he had to say after his uh, search to disprove the biblical narrative. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. The almost incredibly accurate historical memory of the Bible, and particularly so when it is fortified by archaeological fact. And finally, Clifford Wilson, Dr. Clifford Wilson, also uh, an, ag an agnostic, concluded the following. It is the studied conviction of this writer that the Bible is the ancient world's most reliable history textbook. And that is our presentation, ladies and gentlemen. We will now move to the question and answer period. Can I get my Vanna White to uh, come down and man the, man the microphone? Blaze. Just wait till you have the mic to ask a question because it doesn't get recorded or picked up on the live stream if you don't. And by the way, um, if we don't have a title for our YouTube channel yet because you have to have at least 100 subscribers to, to title your YouTube channel, but if you go and Google search, or sorry, YouTube search Christians Podcasting and hit the subscribe button, we can maybe get to a point where I can have a name for the YouTube channel. And all our past lectures are on there, and that's where they stream as well. And if you want to contact us, that's our Gmail address. Any questions or comments?
Mercy Crossing because you didn't show the picture of the golden chariot wheel that didn't have the coral. Yeah, it was, it was, it's most likely a fraud. That's why I didn't show it. Okay. Um, the guy, uh, Ryan Wyatt was his name. He was the original, he, he, I'm not saying he was a fraudster, but everyone that looked at it says there is no way, literally no way, a 3,500-year-old chariot would, would be cleanly laid like that. It would be covered in coral reef. Uh, and the, the wooden part of it would be completely eaten away. So that is, there's literally no way that's a legitimate 3,500-year-old re relic. I know of it. I just didn't include it for that reason. All I saw was the picture of the Yeah, I've I, I saw it, and I saw the video and the documentary, and I investigated, and it, no bueno. Yeah. What, what about the two pillars that mark the crossing? Yes, like the two Solomon. columns. The two columns, one of them has never been found. Again, it all, it all depends on Ryan, Ryan Wyatt? Something Wyatt. Ron. Ron Wyatt, yes. It all depends on his credibility, which I'm not attacking, but he claims to have seen it. It no longer is there. It could have been removed by, by Jordan, because that's the country of Jordan on that side of the uh, Red Sea Gulf. Um, there's only the one that was on the Egyptian side, the Sinai side. Um, and it is a Roman era column and no inscriptions remain on it. So if he's telling the truth, he claims to have seen the other column on the other side and that it had the words Solomon, Pharaoh, death, and all that stuff. Not verifiable, right? I only include stuff that we can point to today. I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just saying there's no evidence of it, but I am aware of it. got to be some sort of, this is the best part of the whole thing. Doesn't anybody disagree with me? You're the only one. But I just wanted, it's just a comment on, it's just so awesome that how frequently people are converted when they set out to prove that Christianity is false. And I, I guess it shows that they are real seekers for truth, that they will dedicate themselves to this, and then God just uses that to convert them. Lee Strobel is another example. C.S. Lewis. I read a really cool article on uh, creation.com that they had about the collecting of the manuscripts of the New Testament and how different it was from the Old Testament because you know the Old Testament was kind of written down and it was passed down and it was rewritten and copied without mistake. You know, like the Dead Sea Scrolls have like nine variations from the Masoretic text and they're like things like how Americans spell center compared to we spell center. You know, there's really no variation but with the New Testament, what you have is you have all these copied manuscripts and they go throughout the, you know, they go in three different directions, mainly down to Egypt and uh, to the Byzantine Empire and to the Latin part of, of Rome. And, and yet, when you bring them together, they complement each other and they give us the original document without flaw because of the copying. And, you know, they're, they're just, it's just astronomical how much it backs itself up to give us accuracy, it's, it, it was just amazing to me, this article. Yep, and I hope that's the impression I gave you guys tonight, the stark difference between our, what we consider the books, because really the Bible is several books. It should be called, it, it, the word biblios in the Greek means library. So the word Bible, it's not a single work, it's a portable library. What's that? Correct, but it, it's, look at the difference between the 66 different works over 2,000 years by 40 plus authors. Moses had a secretary team around him because he's writing about himself after he's dead and we know he didn't resurrect. Compare that to the second largest event in holy book history, the Quran. One guy, one lifetime, one book, no prophecy, borrows history from the Bible, pays homage to the Bible. In a sense, like Mormonism backed off the credibility of Christianity to get off its, get, it, get its wings, 
Islam was backing itself off the credibility of Judeo-Christianity to get its wings. But it turned into a regular conquering empire, not, not, no different than Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan. It grew by the sword. Christianity did not grow by the sword. It was under the sword that it grew. For 300 years in Rome, it spread and spread in northern Africa and, and, and northern Mediterranean regions, uh, Rome and Greece. It grew despite the fact that you had no cultural or military power as a Christian and were often either persecuted or killed or jailed for being a Christian. And it's, that's the circumstances in which Christianity grew. That is radically different than a conquering empire like Islam was, where it's kind of like you're conquered, convert or either die or be heavily taxed. Um, with respect to a textual criticism, would you agree that the whole fiery debate between the advocates of the received text and the advocates of the critical text is a bit of a tempest in a teapot? You know, there's a few mm -hmm. clauses with relation to the Trinity and so on, but would you agree that it's uh, a tempest in a teapot and a very sad division in Christianity? Uh, well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> You mean you're talking about the schism between the yeah, Orthodox? Yeah, so, so it's a bit of a tempest. You need the mic, Joy, or else you don't get picked up on the uh, on the main street live stream. Yeah, you got me going here. Um, what's his name? Um, the the New Testament scholar who used to live on Salt Spring. Um, I think he recently passed away. His name is I've es it's escaped me. He believed that the whole excuse for um, the revised version and all the, the scholarly criticism of the received text was just an excuse to bring in a new version with new doctrines. And I, I mean, I won't go into it, but I've, I have looked into it and I've read people who have it compared the documents and it does, it does seem like a tempest in a teapot to me and an, an excuse to bring in a new version. But anyway, that's just my view. I know Joey has something to say. I know he does. Being in corner, you got to think about it. <laughs> <coughs> um, but did you guys, did I successfully kind of show you the, it's not really like, um, it isn't really close, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The style, the, the, the nature of, the script, of our scriptures, it's like a, a city, New York City, compared to a hot dog stand. I mean, that's the level of the depth and the richness and the testability and the details and the, you know, it's, it's as if God made it easy. Like I said, if I was an alien visiting Earth and looking at the entire history of Earth up until this point and the major influential ideologies, I'd be like, well, this Jesus guy is number one. The same way Time Magazine picked Jesus, an alien coming from another planet would be like, oh, this Jesus guy is the thing that happened here. And Jesus promised that. He says, I come, when Jesus was around in his ministry, his own people wouldn't accept him. But he says, my kingdom is like a mustard seed, smallest seed in the garden, but when it grows, the largest. And does that not turn out to be true, <laughs> all right? From the backwoods of the backyard of the world, which is all he was, where was, he didn't go to Rome, he didn't go to Paris, he didn't do anything fancy. He planted himself in his ministry, very humble numbers at the beginning, into basically overtaking the world. All right, well, thank you for coming. And like I said, today was our last planned session, but if there's anything coming down in September, we're at least off for the summer. We could say that. So thanks for coming. You bet.